Production funding for Behind the Headlines is made possible in part by the WKNO Production Fund, the WKNO Endowment Fund, and by viewers like you. Thank you. The new president of Rhodes College, tonight on Behind the Headlines. I'm Eric Barnes, publisher of the Memphis Daily News. Thanks for joining us. I am joined tonight by Dr. Marjorie Haas, the new president of Rhodes College. Thanks for being here. Oh, it's my pleasure. Thank you for having me. Along with Bill Drees, senior reporter with the Memphis Daily News. So we'll talk um, a bunch about your, your background, about your vision mm -hmm. for Rhodes. You're one of the, we were talking about before, the, 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 the only the third president in the last 30 something years, yes. also the first female president. But let's start with Rhodes and, and for this show, why is Rhodes important to Memphis? What is Memphis, besides to the students mm -hmm. itself, but besides behind the walls of Rhodes, we know mm -hmm. why it's important to the students and faculty, but Rhodes as an institution in the city is important, why? It's, a, it's one of the most important questions you could ask and was a significant question that I asked myself as I was thinking about whether Rhodes would be a place that I would want to come to and to lead. I think you can certainly start by thinking about the ways we have just been good friends and neighbors to the city. Our college is regularly named one of the most service-minded, if not the service-minded, colleges in the, in the country. So our students, our faculty, our staff are out in the community, see themselves as members of the Memphis community. But we also make a significant economic impact on the city. And we've recently done some studies of this. I wanted to know firsthand what that impact looked like. I wanted to be able to set some benchmarks. And it's, it's pretty surprising. Uh, we're a small college, 2,000 students, but we make an impact of uh, over $315 million a year on the city of Memphis. And we do that through our spending that we do here, through the jobs that we create, but also because so many of our students stay in Memphis. 40% of our recent graduating classes have been making Memphis their homes. They're staying here after college, building families and careers. Um, and they are, uh, each, each class that does that, that's about $555 million into the local economy over time. And, and there are about how many kids, uh, young people graduate from Rhodes every year? Uh, approximately 500. Okay, and um, you talked about um, it's a faculty member recently, a friend of mine said that was talking about you and how excited he was that you had come. And oh, that's, he, that's, let's just say that's very good news. <laughs> that's good news. Yeah, that's, that's good, good news. news. But he said, he, from his take, he's been there quite a while, he went back three presidents. So Dodd, uh, President Dodrell, who was before President yes. Trout. Trout was yes. the previous president for yes. 17 years, and then Dodrell. And he said part of what Trout had done was, President Trout, is open the doors of Rhodes. Rhodes, for people who are older, and when I think when I first moved to Memphis, Rhodes was known for being a bit of an island, sure. for being kind of a city over there in Midtown. The kids didn't really come out, they didn't really interact, mm -hmm. and that changed under President Trout. Yes. How important was that to you to know that, the, that you were going to a school, to a college that was engaged with this community? Because many, I went, we talked before, yes. the college I went to when I was there was a small liberal arts school up in Connecticut, was very much isolated from, at that time, mm -hmm. from its surrounding community. And I do think that isolation is the norm. It certainly has been the norm historically. Liberal arts colleges in particular were founded to be spaces of isolation. In their original model, they were founded usually by religious groups. They were, uh, the goal was to create ultimately ministers uh, in that tradition. And they um, had a kind of sense that the way you learned best was to be in a contemplative, away from the world model, almost like a, a cloister. Um, that has significantly shifted nationally uh, obviously, um, in the ensuing you know, several hundred years. And colleges, I think, across the country do see themselves now as part of their communities. But Rhodes is very unique in being immersed in such a vibrant metropolitan area. Many colleges still are in rural areas, small towns, um, suburban areas. And for, to me, this is one of Rhodes' significant strategic drivers 
it is part of the success of Rhodes College is that we are part of a major American city. Yeah. So it's essential. Bill. Um, Dr. Haas, in your, in your, at your installation ceremony, you, your speech talked a good bit about liberal arts in the country in general. And the, these are, are changing times for liberal arts colleges. And, and you said that, that, that there, there are some people who are really questioning mm -hmm. the role of liberal, liberal arts colleges. Tell me what you mean by that. Well, you certainly hear uh, a lot of this rhetoric and you hear this on the political scene and you, I have to say, occasionally hear it even from your colleagues in, in the news business, the sort of offhand comment about, well, philosophy majors can't find jobs or the liberal arts being a, a sort of old-fashioned luxury, and that it's just simply not true. Um, and the data bears that out. You can certainly see that students who are graduating from liberal arts colleges are finding employment. When you talk to hiring managers and you say, what is it you look for in those uh, young people right out of school, they will give you the list of liberal arts skills and commitments, critical thinking, a capacity for lifelong learning and ongoing learning and training, uh, the ability to communicate, the ability to work in teams, the ability to work across difference, uh, the ability to grapple with hard problems. That is the curriculum of, um, of the liberal arts institutions. Mm -hmm. And a recent study was just released actually showing that when you look at lifetime earning and when you look at um, lifetime satisfaction, there is really no difference between STEM majors and majors in the humanities. So, so, so here in Tennessee, with all of the emphasis on, on, on two-year degrees, associate degrees, certification in a specific yes. trade like, like, like welding, like, like the, the craft trades, so to speak, um, where, where, where does a four-year liberal arts college fit into that emphasis that mm -hmm. we're seeing right now? Is there a pushback against that move to, okay, start earning your certification actually while you're in high school? It, these are very good questions, and there's a few different things that sort of are connected there that I would want to address. In the first place, I would only speak highly of people who want to and do earn and a, a trade certificate. I think that's um, an important part of the fabric of um, our country. I think we want to make sure that people for whom that is their life path can earn a decent wage and an ongoing wage in those trades. So I'm a firm supporter of that. But I think we can all agree that we do not and cannot foresee an economy in which the trades are the only drivers. So when we are looking at the kinds of higher uh, order complexities, the kinds of problems that we need to solve, the kinds of um, uh, educated young people that businesses want to hire to be their future leaders, we are looking at students who have studied these kinds of things in, in college. So we don't see this as opposed, we see them as in partnership. Mm -hmm. We certainly want to provide access, and the state of Tennessee does a pretty good job of providing access. The HOPE scholarships uh, really help close the gap for many students, many Rhodes students, and students across Memphis. So I don't see Tennessee as having stepped back from its commitment to four-year education or even to graduate education. I, I see each of those pieces of the pie as having an important role. Uh, it is a student who, who gets two years under Tennessee Promise at a community college or a Tennessee College of Applied Technology, um, it, it, is that student, in your view and in your experience in higher education, likely to go for a, for a four-year degree? Well, this is an interesting question, and I think sometimes there is, particularly in some of the so-called college courses that are being offered in high schools, the dual credit, I think there is sometimes uh, over-promising. Um, it is not the case that many of those courses that you have, uh, you know, degrees and credits you've earned uh, at a technical college or while in high school will actually prepare you to take the next level course at a college like Rhodes College. So I've seen this throughout my career that a student might have taken, say, pre-calculus or even calculus uh, under that 
situation, but they're not truly prepared to succeed in the second level calculus at a college like Rhodes College. So when we work with students and they're bringing in transfer credits, we certainly are happy and willing to award the credits they've earned, but we really try to use advising to make sure that they understand that they need to take the courses that will best prepare them to complete their degree. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And, and you've, you've talked about the image of the liberal arts, and, and I know from being present when, when the new science building and, and facilities there were, were, were dedicated, that you talked a lot about crossing disciplinary lines, that students are doing that at, at your college and at other liberal arts mm -hmm. colleges in, increasingly, that it's not about one narrow pursuit, no. you have students working collaboratively. It's really become the norm. Most of our students double major or they have a major or minor, and increasingly those majors themselves are interdisciplinary. Uh, you may have heard me speak before about my sense that we need to prepare students to really be ready to grapple with the issues of the day. I referred in my inauguration speech to Joseph Ayun's book, uh, Robot Proof, and we need to be able to prepare students to be problem solvers at a very deep and sophisticated level. And the problems we face today, whether they are issues of climate change, whether there's, there are issues of uh, how our economy will thrive with uh, the rise of artificial intelligence, any of those difficult problems, there's no single discipline that will have the answer to those. You need to be able to think very broadly. I sometimes say that what a liberal arts education provides you with is a set of tools, methodologies, to find the truth. It doesn't provide you with an ideology or a simple answer. What, what per, I have so many questions. What percentage of your students, give or take, go on to get graduate degrees? I don't know that I can quote you okay. the exact number off the top of my head, but it's roughly, and it's, some of them go immediately and some of them yeah, go over right. time. Yeah, sure, so I would sure. say roughly about 40%. About 40%. Um, it, it, it's sort of in that first wave, and then later on probably another 20 or 30%. Do you 30%. see that number going? I mean, I know people, it's probably because of my age and my kids' age who are in high school, one's a senior in high right. school, one's in, one's in college. And so people, very much, you know, the conversation that, that I hear, people more and more sort of anecdotally say, oh, you got to get a graduate degree. Mm -hmm. Do you see that, the number of kids getting <clears throat> graduate degrees coming out of Rhodes and in, in, in all colleges yes. increasing? It, I do. And part of that is, again, because of the nature of work, right? As more rote and routine work, and even what used to be considered higher level heuristic work becomes automated, the skills that students need uh, in order to be competitive on the job market just ratchet up one more notch. Uh, we've also done a great job in this country, or a better job, of providing access to higher education. And so a college degree doesn't necessarily set you apart the way that it, it once did. So graduate school is definitely on the rise. And I think a, you know, for our students, that, that's a great match. That broad-based undergraduate degree that really prepares them for entry-level jobs and for that next step. And then a graduate degree that perhaps gives them some deeper depth in a, in a particular technical area. For roads, for all colleges, I mean, it, right now, cost, affordability is a huge issue. You talked about it at your inauguration. You And we should back up a little bit, just timing-wise, you started the job in the summer. Yes, is that in, correct? on you, July 1st, which so, is typical for college. That's when yeah. we usually do those changeovers. Yeah, and there was, a, the, but the inauguration ceremony was in, what, early January? Yes, and okay. that also is typical. Yeah. We, we typically, you know, the, the um, we, we want to have time to sort of build up some excitement and enthusiasm. And because one does not campaign for the <laughs> college presidency, uh, you, you do need some time to craft a sense of vision and mission for the institution. Yeah. So, so just because we talk about your recent inauguration, but you've been in the job since the summer. So just so people yes, kind of track have that the sense. Time. College affordability, it's a huge issue. It's, it's yes. you know, it, it's some years, college across the country, the tuition was going up 5%. You've got state schools that are seeing um, less funding from their legislatures. They are mm -hmm. charging more for out-of-states. And where Rhodes is, what is tuition, room, and board? If I looked at the Rhodes website, the, the sticker price, right, the as sticker it were, price. is yes. what? Right the now? sticker price is going to be something uh, close to $60,000. Yeah, and good. obviously, there are very few families that can simply write a check for that. Sure. Um, and so we, uh, we do have some, and they are willing and able to afford that kind of education, that cost of education. But for students who can't, the lar one of the largest chunks of the college presidency role is raising the money for scholarships uh, to help close that gap. 
and uh, the vast majority of our students receive some kind of financial aid. It's a combination of institutional aid, money that we provide. It's a combination of perhaps aid they bring with me if they're Pell, if bring with them if they're Pell Grant eligible or the Hope Scholarship, and then some of our students do borrow. The students who borrow graduate with an average uh, at Rhodes with an average of twenty five thousand dollars worth of college loan debt, which is more than I would like to see, but it to me is a reasonable number particularly given what we know data-wise about their potential earnings and the kinds of careers that they will have as a result of that education. And, and that, you, you addressed it, but I'll, I'll, we'll follow up on debt. that has been a big spotlight on that over the last few years. The uh, Obama administration put uh, a lot of pressure on some yes. colleges about the amount of debt that they were racking up. Yes. Um, I think some of that was more about maybe online schools and schools yes. that were almost yes. mills of, you, you yes. almost using that student's ability to borrow. Yes to line their coffers. Yes. I mean, the, the, a... There are some very, very bad actors. And um, it's dangerous when we set policy based on a few bad actors. We should be able to find ways to deal with those. I just returned from Washington, D.C. yesterday, last night, um, where I was meeting with uh, the National Association of Independent Colleges and Universities. I'm on the board of that organization. And that's our major uh, policy arm. And of course, affordability is the top issue on the minds of college presidents across the country and on our, our policy makers. As you no doubt know, um, the uh, Congress is considering a rewriting of the Higher Education Authorization Act. And a big piece of what they're thinking about is certainly this question of affordability. So the House has put forward, um, I think their act is called the PROSPER Act. There's some pieces in it that we were meeting with uh, our legislators to talk about that we think will not be helpful, but we were pleased to see that there is a commitment to increasing Pell and to looking for ways, again, to make access to college possible. My dream for Rhodes is that talent is the only determiner of whether you get to come to Rhodes. That's, we can't afford to um, meet the need of every talented student. We wish we could. Uh, back to Bill, there's about nine minutes left. Okay. You set some goals at, at the inauguration. Uh, the education department at, at, at Rhodes have, has been working for, for quite a while. The campus is, is used to be known as a Peace Corps hotbed yeah. uh, uh, or hotbed. Now, yeah. now it's known for Teach for America. So tell us what, you, what your plans are in, in terms of turning out teachers from Rhodes. This really returns to the question we were asking earlier about our relationship with the city of Memphis. Uh, we are launching a new master's degree in urban education. We think that if we want to make a significant impact, impact on the city, being able to produce teachers with a passion for uh, teaching in our city schools and with the skills to not only teach but to lead eventually is one of the most significant things we can do. So this program will launch, will start small, but once we ramp up, our hope is to be producing 100 well-trained teachers a year and really to become a national model for how to do teacher certification and education in collaboration with the liberal arts. And you also have a, a new center that is the Lynn and Henry Turley Center. Yes. Tell, me, t tell me what that's about. The Lynn and Henry uh, Turley Memphis Center is, I think, the culmination of a long dream, certainly for the college and also, I believe, for the Turleys. And it will become a focal point for our interaction with Memphis. So all of the many programs that we have now that help our students engage with the city, and also that bring the city into our, onto our campus. Those will all be uh, housed within the center, um, and it really will allow us to double our commitment to that. So, so stay tuned. It's going to be very, very exciting. Which is Henry Turley, who has been on the show, actually, mm -hmm. the local developer downtown, yes. involved with uh, Memphis Magazine and so on. It is Henry and, and his yes. wife, Lynn. So and back to you, Lynn. So, so is is that center will, for instance, the the Mike Curb program, will that be a part of that? Uh, uh, come under that umbrella? And yes, that's ultimately mm -hmm. our goal. It will take a little bit of time for us to organize. We need to hire some of the right folks in. So, as you know, on a college campus, we do things collaboratively.
collectively, not just by fiat of the president. So we are working very closely with the faculty involved in those programs to figure out the best structure. But yes, that is that mm. will ultimately be how we administer these things. So, so much of the discussion about what is next for Memphis when, when it gets down to specifics talks about higher paying jobs, better mm -hmm. jobs for, 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 for Memphians. And a lot of times, uh, higher pay is a relative thing in a city that has such a low median mm -hmm. wage here, here in Memphis. Um, what, what, what do you think is the best pursuit of those higher paying jobs, those better jobs that improve the quality of life for yeah. all Memphians? Well, I think, you know, at, at Rhodes, we talk, we certainly want students to be successful in their careers, and we, we think that's very, very important. Um, but we firmly believe, and I deeply believe, that education is not a private good, it's a public good. And I think we have really lost sight of that in our narrative around higher education in this country, and it's a tragedy. I tell our students that we want them to be successful, but that's not how we measure the success of a Rhodes education. It's not about what this education does for you as an individual, it's about what it allows you to do to heal the world. And so we need to make sure that our students are equipped on a wide range uh, of ways, in a wide range of ways, to translate that education into the common good. Yes, we certainly know that um, uh, a college education sets you up for a, a life of greater wealth. We know that a Rhodes education in particular sets you up for that. Our graduates are among the um, highest paid wage earners in the state of, Tennessee, state of Tennessee. But that is not the, the, the be all and end all. And while we're proud of that, what we're most proud about is what they use those skills for, as you say, to raise the boat for all Memphians, for all Tennesseans, and for all in the world. With, with just four or five minutes left, um, how do you uh, interact with, it might be compete with, or collaborate with the other higher ed um, institutions mm. in town? U of M, CBU, Lemoyne Owen. Yes. Um, I'm forgetting, but just how do you know all those presidents? Do you I, all go get I coffee? <laughs> I mean, do you fight over? <laughs> we some we of weep the, into the, our into students? our handkerchiefs I mean, together. How, how yeah. does that all work? No, I think happen? there's there's some real room for growth in this area. There's certainly, the the relationships are very positive and supportive, and you we we really don't compete with each other. The beauty and genius of American higher education is the wide range of missions, as you were alluding to before. And so there is room for, you know, every student in Memphis could find a home and a place in higher education within Memphis because of the diversity. But I do think that gives us some really good opportunities to collaborate both programmatically, but also even in the ways that we help frame the narrative around higher education in Memphis. We're excited about the new brand, city branding initiative and uh, we're looking forward to working to talk about the ways that Memphis is a great college town, a great place to come. Rhodes, as you know, draws nationally. So while uh, some of our students come from Memphis, the vast majority do not. And part of what we're helping them understand when we help them understand that Rhodes might be a good home for them academically is that Memphis will be a great home for them to live in and work in for four years, and then again, we hope for even longer than that. And, and Dr. Trout talked about this continually. More Rhodes graduates are staying yes. here in Memphis after they graduate. 40%, and we talked about the economic impact that that makes. I refer to Rhodes as a, uh, a brain faucet instead of a brain drain. Many cities experience a brain drain where the you know, most we're talented, well-educated students leave the city. We like to see that what we're doing is bringing outsiders to Memphis and then they help find a home here and become part of the fabric of the city. With just a couple minutes left, you uh, we mentioned earlier you're the only third president in the last 30 something years. Yes. First female president. Yes. How important is that? Is it, 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 some part of me wants to say, is that still important? But it, obviously it is. And given everything that's yes. going on nationally, the conversation about women and glass ceilings and so yes. on. Yes. And, and, and even some of the more difficult issues yeah. around Me Too and um, you know around Title IX and sexual assault issues, I do think it is still a big deal. And uh, it's easy for me sometimes to forget that it is a big deal because I'm just here doing my work. Always been a woman, so um, you know don't know any other way to do my work. Right. But um, I'm very aware of how important it is for our students, in particular, to serve as a role model. 
And I do think that I can bring and shed light on some of the ways that, that we do need to be more inclusive, not only for women, but on a whole host of vectors. So that focus on inclusion and on making sure that we build a community where every single person in it feels like they're at the center of the experience is very, very important to me. And, but just a bit more bio, we have a minute left here. You're, you were where before Rhodes? Before I came to Rhodes, I was president of Austin College in Sherman, Texas, another very fine liberal arts college. Before that, I was provost at Muhlenberg College in Allentown, Pennsylvania, also a fine liberal arts college. And before that, I was a faculty member at Muhlenberg, spent my career as a faculty member there. Um, and, and that was my first job, uh, professor of philosophy at Muhlenberg College. And you've been in Memphis now <clears throat> eight, nine months. Yes. Separate from your experience of, of, of the, the school, what's been most surprising about being in Memphis? Uh, well, it's been an incredibly welcoming city. Uh, people have been warm and welcoming. They have fed us. They have loved us. They've invited us into their homes. They've taken us to their favorite restaurant. We love the diversity in the city. We love that there is this deep, complex history to be mined and to be addressed. And we love that this is a place where every single member of Memphis can and should be committed to making a difference. Dr. Ross, thank you for thank being you here. Thank you so much really for having me. It. I, I look forward to future conversations. Absolutely. Thank you. Absolutely. And thank you for joining us. Join us again next week. Good night.